So a, a couple of uh, quick points to uh, expand on what the remarkable presentation we've just heard. Obviously, radioactive material piled outside, doors open when they are trying to unload fuel, radioactive fuel from inside the uh, damaged core, uh, the, uh, having to pump the radioactive gases out directly into the atmosphere, all uh, very, very troubling. Uh, I find this pr particular photo that you didn't get to uh, somewhat ironic. This is John on top of the co core after the partial meltdown with basically an ice cream suit. And uh, it says on his hat, your safety is our business, Atomic Interna Atomics International. Um, yeah. So um, this is how we found out about it. I showed this to you, I believe, at the, our first session in February. Um, st students working with me at UCLA when I was teaching there in 1979 came across records um, of the uh, partial meltdown uh, uh, tagged for us by Dorothy Boberg, who had done a study um, sometime earlier that had uh, discussed the accident but had some difficulty getting some of the other documents. And you'll notice that very complex technological term on the far right, melted blob. Um, you don't want fuel to melt. Um, when it melts, radioactive materials can be released. Uh, here are other photos of the damaged fuel. Uh, so you may have heard some people claim that there was no partial meltdown and that there was no melting of fuel. Um, the fuel had cladding kind of like a uh, curtain rod with the fuel pellets inside it. And the uranium fuel and the cladding formed a eutectic, which is a low melting alloy that melts at a lower temperature than either the uranium or the cladding alone. And the evidence is crystal clear. There was melting of the uh, fuel, including of the uranium. Secondly, as John points out, there was no containment structure. And indeed, what you've described as you, what you remember from being in that control room at the time um, matches and expands on what the records indicate, which is that they were having trouble with the reactivity in the core and they decided to pump the radioactive gases out of the core in order to try to see if they could uh, uh, solve the problem. As you heard in the film footage, it's just extraordinary. They had a power excursion, power, which means the power goes on excursion, on a trip. It increases exponentially in fractions of a second. And they could barely shut the reactor down, but after a year and a half, uh, an hour and a half, only an hour and a half, of not being able to figure out what caused it, they started it up again and ran for another two weeks in the presence of very high radiation readings. And again, no containment structure. Uh, radioactive material was put, uh, put into these uh, tanks and then intentionally uh, released into the atmosphere for weeks. And what's particularly troubling about all that is how the Atomic Energy Commission and the company that ran the facility for it, then called Atomics International, a division of North American Aviation, um, kept it secret for five weeks and eventually released a press statement uh, embargoed for Saturday morning papers. Some of you who are old enough will remember that if you want to kill a story, you set, embargoed it for Saturday morning papers. The title says, Fuel Element Failure, nothing about melting fuel. And it says that a parted fuel element was observed. Singular, one, not melting, just that it had parted. And what's really remarkable are these statements. The fuel element damage is not an indication of unsafe reactor conditions. It was one of the more serious reactor accidents in um, uh, certainly in nuclear history to that point. Um, the, no release of radioactive materials to the plant or its environs occurred, and operating personnel were not ha exposed to harmful conditions. Um, as you heard, the uh, radiation monitors went off scale. Um, they were having to uh, vent stuff and they were venting radioactivity into the atmosphere at the, at the very moment that they issued that press statement. And they said the occurrence is important only from a technical standpoint. So the Atomic Energy Commission kept this secret for 20 years until NBC was able to break the story. Um, so we have several members of a panel who are going to expand on this a little bit from their experience. And the first is Dan Parks. Dan also worked in the SRE, the sodium reactor experiment, but after the accident occurred. And um, I, I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions that may help uh, explicate this. Is your mic on? Yes. Super. No. Yes, can you hear? So you were sent into the SRE building to try to clean off radioactivity from surfaces, 
Is that right? Correct. How did you clean off the radioactivity? What uh, uh, <coughs> fancy equipment were you provided to get the radioactivity off of these surfaces? High-tech equipment, which was uh, Bactine, which we've probably all seen in the drugstore. It's an uh, antiseptic solution, and we used uh, feminine napkins, Kotex, because they were highly, <laughs> highly absorbent uh, of whatever's on the floors and walls. So. So the radioactive contamination on the walls and floors was cleaned up using Kotex? Kotex and Bactine, yes. <laughs> John reminded me that uh, he was the uh, one that uh, invented the idea of using the uh, sanitary napkins and the oh, Bactine. Oh, no. <laughs> Actually, it was the secretary that mentioned it might be a good idea, and I, I used it. <laughs> It was, enough, uh, enough, uh, enough. Never mind. <laughs> uh, John, um, there was one photograph of John Pace um, um, on top of um, uh, the SRE reactor. And I should make it clear to everybody, the reactor is below it's the top. They were working on top of it. That's how they pulled reactor fuel out, how they got new fuel in. That's called the shield plug. Okay, so you also worked at times on that shield plug, and there was an incident that occurred for you um, in somewhat the same location where John is photographed? Certainly. Um, I was asked to take a uh, core gas uh, sample and analyze the uh, radioactivity and see how high it was in the gas system and what was in the uh, holding tanks. That's the way you do it. And in doing so, you're required to go out on the uh, shield plug where John, you saw him laying on the plug, and I had a little cylinder that uh, withdrew the uh, gas from down in the core and in the um, uh, holding tanks. And uh, in doing so, I got contaminated myself. I wasn't warned of it. And I uh, lost my clothing and was required to uh, personally decontaminate, scrub with good old Bactine and soap and before they would allow me to go home. What do you mean you lost your clothes? Well, you can't take the uh, contamination home with you to your family, and so they seize your clothing and require, you're, you're required to take a shower and shower the contamination off your body hair and so on, shampoo. And they give you a, uh, uh, other clothing to go home in, like uh, in my case, there were coveralls and a pair of shoe covers, and, and that was the extent of it. You told me once that as dangerous as the reactors were, there were more dangerous facilities on the property. Uh, what in particular? Well, we had several. The one that comes to mind to me is the uh, hot cell, which makes this, uh, it's even, I think, worse in many uh, um, instances because at the hot cell, they dissected fuel elements, irradiated fuel elements there. And uh, so when you're doing that, uh, that's pretty risky business. My understanding is that um, irradiated nuclear fuel, high-level waste from around the country was mm -hmm. shipped in to this facility and then cut apart in that hot laboratory. Yes, they, uh, well, to draw you a quick picture of it, it's, a, it's a built, obviously a building, but with all these individual cells in, in, inside, and uh, there was approximately eight or ten of them, and uh, they have these what they call manipulators. They're like slaves. And the walls uh, separating the workers and the fuel elements where the actual work went on are about eight foot th thick. And so you're looking through a leaded glass window in at this element that's probably reading in the, somewhere in the area of uh, two or 3,000 uh, R per hour, which is, is death if you were to be exposed to it directly. So they're decladding these fuel elements and that's creating dust and dirt and so on. Well, every, occasionally they would have a fire or a flood and what do the workers do? I mean, you run. You absolutely run when the fire alarm goes off or, or any other, other radiation alarm. You run because it may mean your life. And did you have some role or some <coughs> recollection uh, that you wanted to pass on regarding the sodium burn pit? Oh, yes. Well, uh, for tell those what, you... Tell people what that was, first of all. Okay, it was a uh, pit where, uh, like a small lake and they took the uh, various chemicals, and especially sodium and NAC. NAC and sodium are both, both used primarily for the coolants in the primary cooling system of reactors. It, it disperses the heat. Well, they would uh, take this used NAC after it was removed from the reactor out, put it in drums, 55-gallon drums, take it to the sodium burn pit, uh, put it in a small rowboat, uh, one drum at a time, 
and uh, row it out to the center of the lake, push the drum in the water, and then get row back and get behind the coverage of uh, a, a blockhouse. And they would shoot the drum uh, with a 30 odd six rifle, therefore allowing the water to seep into the drum. And when water comes in contact with NAC or sodium, it's, it's a very uh, serious explosion. And this is the way that they, allowed, they burned off this waste material as well as other chemicals and so on. So this burning was in the open air overlooking Simi Absolutely. Valley. And Absolutely. The smoke would travel all over the complex up there, including Rocketdyne and uh, the Atomics International Complex, and it would travel uh, into Simi Valley as well as the San Fernando Valley. And radioactive and chemical waste really weren't supposed to be burned there, just clean sodium, but they ended up do having a fair amount of radioactivity and chemicals, and we've got now contamination both in the groundwater beneath that site and some of it migrated off-site to what was then the Brandeis Camp Institute. Yes, that is true. There's, there was two, pit, two burn pits that I was familiar with. One was on the Rocketdyne side, and there's another one on, uh, on the uh, Nuke side, which was Atomics International. In my understanding, there was a, may have been a couple of others, but those are the two that I was, from, that I was familiar with Thank at the time. Thank you, Dan, very much. Our next speaker is Bonnie Klee, who also worked from time to time in the SRE building. And... Um, uh, lives still uh, close to the site um, and has been instrumental in being able to get compensation for the workers. So first of all, Bonnie, have there been any occupational health studies of the workers at this facility and what did they find if there were any? Um, yes, in the late 90s, DOE funded an independent study, uh, UCLA did the work, and they found um, higher, higher death rates from blood, lymph, lymph cancers, and several other cancers. Um, and you, your own situation? Oh, my own situation, you mean my cancer? I was diagnosed in 1995 with a solid tumor, and my doctors asked me where I worked, and I said I worked at Atomics International, and they said they were treating a lot of employees, and they said, don't forget brain cancer. They had a whole board over at the hospital with brain cancer. So um, do you want me to talk about the, the, the numbers of claims? Hey, let's now deal with that. So that study showing excess cancers for the workers my understanding has contributed to a decision by the U.S. government to create a compensation program. Why don't you tell us about yes. that? Yes. In 2000, President Clinton signed a compensation program for all the Cold War workers. And this was a result of health studies done at different facilities throughout the country. They were all coming back with excess cancers. So in 2000, a program was uh, initiated for all the workers at 350 companies in America who did Cold War work. They didn't protect the workers. They didn't tell them what they were doing. They didn't warn them. Uh, and then when the workers got cancer and filed a lawsuit, the federal government fought them in court. So this new compensation program, the Energy Employees Compensation Act, was passed. and. Um, so I, I was number 83, was my claim in the whole country. I got in early because I read about it in Seattle. Got my claim in, and by 2006, uh, I was denied. They, they had no data to deny me. They, what they have to do is do dose reconstruction. Well, they didn't have any data, so they used surrogate data from another facility. And they said, no, you didn't get 50% dose. Um, and I looked at the claims. We were the lowest compensated company in the whole country. Less than 10% of our workers were getting compensated. And they have um, what they call the um, special exposure cohort. If you get denied, you can file a, an appeal. So I did that on behalf of all the workers. Filed it in 2006. And they accepted it by 2010. All of the Downey workers were paid. All of Canoga was covered because they had one monitoring program that covered all four facilities. So Downey, Downey is finished, Canoga is finished, I'm still working on Santa Susana and, and uh, the DeSoto facility. So with your assistance, how many uh, former employees or survivors of former employees 
um, uh, have been compensated to date, roughly, or how much money has been provided as compensation? No, I didn't. I didn't bring the number of people, but so far, the workers have been compensated 154 million dollars for their cancers, and I'm still working on it. And our last speaker on this panel is Dr. Robert Dodge. Those of you who've come to the prior meetings have uh, heard him very helpfully explaining some of the health impacts. We're going to transition from this panel to discussing the current situation, kind of bookending. Uh, the government having kept, uh, having been sloppy 55 years ago and kept it secret for a long time, and now taking a look at how well they're living up to their commitments to clean up the mess they made. But the reason for that is all because of potential health effects. And uh, Dr. Dodge is just going to summarize for us um, uh, some of those implications. So as a result of the partial nuclear meltdown and other nuclear accidents, spills, and releases, the Susanna Susanna Field Lab site is contaminated with radioactive materials such as strontium-90, cesium-137, plutonium-239, and tritium. Um, in 2012, the EPA released results of a radiation survey that showed 500 samples at the levels above ground, uh, background, uh, in some cases up to 1,000 times over background uh, levels. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences, which I always say that's the, the scientists' scientists, those are our top scientists in the country, and all federal radiation protection agencies uh, accepted the principle that there is no, no safe level of radiation. All doses, no matter how small, increase one's risk of cancer to some degree. Exposures to these radionuclides can cause cancers, uh, increased risks of heart disease, and a multitude of other problems. There can be a latency period of up to years or even decades after the exposure with the onset of the disease. In addition, rocket engine testing at the site and other activities at the Santa Susana lab have led to contamination by other chemically hazardous substances such as TCE and other volatile organic compounds. Also heavy metals such as mercury and lead, dioxins, perchlorate, PCBs, and more, a relative who's who of toxic contaminants. These toxic materials can also cause cancer, developmental disorders, birth defects, neurotoxic effects, and or health impacts, particularly to uh, pregnant ladies and, and newborn children uh, and, and fetuses in the growing stages. At our last work group meeting, Dr. Adrian Katner presented the results of a multi-year study uh, funded by the Federal Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry about how people could potentially become ex uh, contaminated from the, the field lab runoff. The report also confirmed that toxic substances have contaminated the soil, groundwater, uh, <clears throat> surface water, and have been released into the air at the site, and some appear to have migrated off-site to neighboring areas uh, and at levels of significant health concern. Several other health studies on the health impacts associated with the exposures have been concluded. One, which is similar to what Bonnie reported at the UCLA School of Public Health, found significant increases in death rates from cancers of lung, lymph, blood systems, as well as, as, well as other organs among workers, okay, who were exposed uh, compared to similar workers at the site with lower exposure. So the higher the exposure, the higher the cancer and risk rate. The most exposed workers were three times as likely to die of cancer as the least exposed workers. Another study was performed of the off-site population for, for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and they found that the incidence rate was more than 60% greater among residents living within a two-mile radius of the Santa Susana field, uh, <clears throat> more than among residents living more than five miles away. And these were for the following types of cancers. Cancers of the thyroid, upper aerodigestive, which is the mouth, nasal cavities, pharynx, larynx, and esophagus, the bladder and blood and lymph areas, uh, and blood tissues and chemistries like leukemias, lymphomas, and multiple myelomas. These are all areas where these radioisotopes settle there, like in the bladder and the colon, et cetera, and where they continue to have their ongoing effects. As indicated at the last work group, meeting 216 times in recent years, 216 times toxic materials have migrated off-site, okay, when they were picked up by rainwater and transported uh, into contaminated levels at areas in excess of recognized pollution limits. That is to say, levels deemed by regulators to be safe for public or the environment. <clears throat> 
Contaminated groundwater has also migrated off-site. The facility is on the hills above and, uh, above, and the contamination flows down to the, the city below. It is therefore extremely important from a health standpoint that all contamination that can be found is cleaned up so as to protect people and the environment from this radioactive and toxic pollution. Thank you. Dan, I just remembered how many people filed claims. <laughs> We have uh, 3,800 workers who have filed claims for cancer. Mm. And how many do you think have gotten the claims? Um, only one-third have been paid so out far. Of thousand, then. Okay. Out of 1,000. Mm. Out of 3,800. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a few questions uh, because what we really need to discuss is the current situation, which we've transitioned to somewhat, which is the contamination that's on the site today and um, efforts to clean it up uh, or not. Uh, so if we could have some house lights. Again, we're gonna, we'll have another extended uh, Q&A after we talk about the cleanup, but we do want to give a chance for people right now to ask a few questions. Uh, we've got Cindy Gortner here and Chloe Weigel with uh, Teens Against Toxins. She's going to run around to the other side. So if I get a little bit more house light so I can make sure I see uh, any hands in the air, then Cindy uh, and Chloe will bring the microphone to you. Go ahead. I'm David Troy. I'm wondering about, uh, are Geiger counters legal to find? Can we use them? Can we get them? Or, and... Uh, uh, I've been uh, doing some gardening, and I had a Geiger counter that I don't think was working because it didn't make any noise at all. Uh, and I, I was in a garden by the Orchid family ranch. Um, I'm wondering how safe that is. Does anybody know? Geiger counters are legal. I can tell you that. Uh, Dan, did you want to address? Um, the reason it's not clicking, perhaps, is that you need to change the batteries. Um, it should click whether there is additional radioactivity or not because there's always background radioactivity. But a Geiger counter is not a good way to tell anything. You need to really be able to do very detailed soil measurements looking for particular radioisotopes and something that those of us who are just everyday citizens can't really do. Um, there was some effort to look at Orchid Ranch for some possible perchlorate. They found a little bit there that's not radioactive but chemically toxic. But there have been very few measurements made off the property. Um, almost all of them have been just directly around the site, although all of those did find some trouble. Okay. Chloe, over there in the polka dot. Kind of a piggyback question. Are there professional agencies that can be recommended that we can measure the radioactivity on our property? Right by Runkle Creek is our concern, but I'm sure there are a lot of other areas as well because we don't really know in our areas how severe it is. So how close are you to the development at Runkle Ranch? I think three to four miles, I hope. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. But the creek borders on our property. Okay, so Runkle Ranch uh, was found to have um, some significant levels of strontium-90. It's a radionuclide that concentrates in the bone, can cause bone cancer and leukemia, has about a 30-year half-life, dangerous for about 600 years. Um, it was controversial. The developer brought in another uh, contractor who got lower readings, though still some readings, and agencies have approved the development. Um, you're much further away. It is really hard to make measurements for yourself or to find a laboratory to, to do this and then to be able to compare those measurements to something else. And so I, I, we're all at two questions kind of similarly, and I basically will give you this answer. If you want to feel more protected, you need to get the site cleaned up so there's no longer a source. That's, the rest of it, it, there's not much we can do. But to get rid of that source, that's the key thing that we have to do. The contamination on the hill that wants to go off the hill. Okay, somebody on the side of the room. My name is Ralph Powell. I was a sergeant in security at Atomics International from 1962 to 1968. And I'm wondering, my question is, what's the chances of tracking in 
radiation to the family. I lost my only son from leukemia. 1967, my wife had breast cancer. Dan Parks would like to answer that. Dan, go ahead. Dan Parks. Uh, you were, uh, did you work at Santa Sue? Your chances were very good because uh, all you were probably only wearing is a film badge and, and I don't think you probably were required to monitor your clothing or yourself when you went home. And uh -huh. we, had a lot, we had a lot of airborne, huge amounts of airborne activity being released from what we have about eight running reactors up there at any given time. And uh, you could run across it and not even know it. It, would be, it could be airborne or you could maybe touch something and still not realize it. And I would think that, uh, like where John worked, I mean, the activity was so high on the floors and the walls and in the parking lots and cars. So I would think that you're right on the money with that. One quick, I want to ask John, you had one slide you weren't able to show us, and it kind of makes this point. You want to explain what this is? I don't know if you... Notice there, see, the marker here, I can do that too, but I'm going to be talking about this gentleman right here. I'm going to talk about this gentleman right here. This was uh, Dr. Fox right here. He's wearing uh, regular street clothes. He's not even dressed down like all the rest of us are over here. He's, he was the person overseeing the, the, the SRE. He, would, he, he thought he was too good to be able to have to dress down like the rest of us. He thought he knew he was special, so so that's why I put that uh, picture on there. He was our he was our boss right there, see. <laughs> so, but uh, talking to that about the gentleman just spoke just a minute ago, taking it home, uh, you can do that very easily because with the SRE reactor, just my experience, 24/7 uh, radiation was coming out of that reactor, going all over the hill. It could be the ones in. Rockadine, it could be anywhere on the hill. You was being exposed every day you was there. Because with the SRE reactor, with the, t the type of works going on, no containment building to hold it in, you, you went home with it on you. So that's what my wife worries about, too. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to com could I comment on that? Um, in my experience with the workers, a lot of them were told when they went home to wash their clothes separately or bury them in the backyard. Um, also, I knew some workers at the plutonium building after they had a large explosion and uh, they went home in their clothes and the Atomic Energy Commission had to go in and test their house and for, um, for plutonium. So it did, it went, it was on us. Uh, Delaney, did you wanna say something now about some of the work you're doing, and then we'll go to the other side of the room. Uh, Cindy, can you give the mic to Delaney? I'm Delaney Blaze. I'm with the aerospace.org and uh, core advocacy. Uh, for a while now, I've been helping workers of areas one, two, and three try to navigate the Energy Employee Occupational Illness Compensation Program that Bonnie spoke about earlier. Um, one thing that is a problem with this program is that area one, two, and three workers are not included or considered to be eligible to apply. And one of the reasons is because when the act was enacted by Congress, the Department of Energy, I think they realized that by saying they were exclusive to area four, they would minimize their liability to environmental cleanup and to the workers. However, history, shows us when we review historical documents that the Department of Energy was very active in areas one, two, and three. There was waste dumping, there was waste disposal, there was operations and facilities in areas one, two, and three. There was a lot of undocumented worker rotation into and out of nuclear areas, a lot of waste transport. And in order to even access area four, you have to cross one, two, and three in order to even get there. So I think what we need to do is make sure that we uh, acknowledge history and we look at the historical documents, most of which are hosted on the Department of Toxic Substances Control website, which are being ignored, and make sure that we ask for a radiological survey of areas one, two, and three in their entirety, 
that we get these workers included into this program and that we make sure we get a complete cleanup. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Uh, oh, one more, uh, Chloe, uh, uh, William Bowling, and then we're going to move on to the next section, and then we'll have more questions and answers at the end. Hi, William Preston Bowling, Aerospace Contamination Museum of Education. My question is for Robert Dodge. Um, during the couple of weeks of this meltdown, uh, they uh, released uh, radioactive gases into the air. And anyone who knows the history of Simi Valleys and the San Fernando Valleys, we had uh, milk and beef and oranges. Um, how does that affect those? Sure. Well, the, the thing about the radioactive isotopes is, is they're taken up by all living things as, as though they were essential life-giving uh, compounds. Uh, the, the strontium-90, the body looks at as potass I'm sorry, as, as calcium. So, and, and again, and that's actually where PSR, the physicians group, got their Nobel Peace Prize because uh, the release of atmospheric uh, strontium-90 from nuclear weapons tests released strontium-90, and it wasn't very long before American physicians found strontium-90 in the baby teeth of humans. Humans, okay, and so when human babies are having uh, are radioactive in their teeth, later to go on to develop leukemias and things like that, it wasn't long before President Kennedy immediately signed unilaterally the the, the limited test ban treaty, and that doesn't it, that's not unique to nuclear weapons. It also in this in this nuclear meltdown and and atomic uh, uh, reactions, you release the strontium 90. So all things that potentially use calcium, such as cows or cow's milk, gets contaminated. Uh, cesium looks like potassium to the body. Potassium is universally taken through all parts of the body, and again, they have half-lives of 30 years, but in medical terms, it takes 20 to 30 half-lives to make them inert. So that's 600 years they remain uh, effective. Uh, plutonium-239 is the most toxic substance we know on the planet, with a half-life of 24,000 years, requiring a half million years to, radi to, to render it you know, medically inert. So these are incredibly toxic things. That's wherein, we, again, we, we emphasize there is no safe level. You can take it in now, but it just sits there and, and, and emits and emits and emits and emits, okay? And if you're lucky and you don't get it in, within years or decades, I think that's great. But I mean, you never know. You're never outside that risk. So, yeah. Dan, could I have uh, Dan Parks talk about the bird cages that were brought in? No, no it's an important story. No, no, the plutonium bird cages are not for birds. They're, they're, they brought in um, uranium, we right? We need to move quickly for, on to the next, but why don't you tell the story, because I don't think I've heard it. Okay. It's an important story. Uh, bird cages. Uh, <laughs> the fuel that was uh, built to, for our SNAP reactors, that's my, uh, that's my connection with the bird cages. Fuel was manufactured down at the DeSoto plant at 8900 DeSoto Canoga Park. That's where they built the fuel elements for the various SNAP reactors. Um, they would send these fuel elements up to Santa Susana for low uh, testing, various types of um, low yield testing, I think is the word for it. Um, and when they would ship the fuel up to Santa Susana, it went down the public roadways down what uh, uh, Devonshire and then down Panga and then up the hill. Well, um, <clears throat> on some of the bird cages that we found, we, we smeared them and checked them when they came in. We found little metal shavings on the exterior of these um, bird cages, and the uh, little metal shavings turned out to be uh, enriched uranium, or at least that's what we thought. They looked like a little metal shaving that you'd see in a shop. And uh, one day I was doing my job and looking around, and I found all these metal shavings on the uh, exterior of the bird cages. And I took them back to the lab and counted them, and they were just extremely hot. Uh, so what you've got to ask yourself is how much contamination was spread from uh, the DeSoto headquarters building uh, up to Santa Susana uh, on the roadway, the public roadway. And then on, uh, at various uh, sites on the hill, how many people got it in their shoes, got it on their hands, and didn't even realize it. So that's the, uh, the bird cage. Just uh, to explain what a bird cage is for a moment, <laughs> um, and I've not heard this story before, Highly enriched uranium or plutonium uh, can cause a small nuclear explosion if too much is brought together too quickly. I mean, that's indeed why we have atomic bombs, and that's what a nuclear reactor is, except it's a much more controlled reaction. So to keep the material from reaching a critical mass, they put a subcritical amount inside what they called a birdcage so that you couldn't get another birdcage close enough to it that supposedly you would get a critical mass and it could blow up. 
Um, and apparently these bird cages got contaminated in the process. So yeah, if I can just add, the bird cages are a square device with a little cylinder mounted in the center, yeah. and they would put four or five elements in, in, the, in that little cylinder. And like Dan ex, uh, uh, explained, you can't have too many fuel elements in one collection or you have a critical mass going to happen. So that's, that was the process for shipping fuel to uh, the Santa Susana. They shipped it in a bird cage, and they were just a square device with uh, this little cylinder mounted in the center. Well, on the uh, outer perimeter of the square device, it was angular uh, aluminum or whatever. Well, that's where these little metal shavings uh, settled, and so therefore they were spreading it. Who knows where? Okay, uh, what we know is uh, we have people who were uh, working at the site, one of whom was there during the partial nuclear meltdown, one of whom was there some years afterwards. Bonnie, I forget which years you, so you were there, but early 60s. Early 60s. And uh, we have a physician who's told you about some of the health impacts of some of the substances that were on the site. Now we know that the, those materials are still on the site and need to be cleaned up. And so we're going to shift now into the second part of our program. We're going to have our, our panelists uh, can go ahead and return to their seats. We will have another Q&A at the end of the second period, and you'll be able to talk to any of these people. I wanted to thank this nice gentleman for coming oh, on. Let's, Absolutely. Let's, All the way. let's thank John Pace.